Coming up on Market to Market, rural America remains stuck in the middle of a potential trade war and market analysis with Angie Setzer next. In Oklahoma on the Southern Plains and, and so. Wherever your operation takes you or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 13 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. Rural Americans are paying more to get to the farm supply store and opening their wallets a bit wider to make a purchase. For those making the tires and hitch pins, producer prices rose 2.1% as compared to a year ago. Once the more volatile factors of food and fuel are removed, the rate of inflation moved 2.7% higher. It's a good thing the grocery aisles are friendly because the final bill has gone up. Gasoline has hit a 12-month high and the prices for food have increased 2.4% over the same period. Without the price swings caused by food and fuel, the core rate for consumer prices rose 2.1%. President Trump and President Xi continue to posture over tariffs. This week, President Trump made it clear TPP was back on the table. No matter what happens, rural America could get caught in the middle of all the wrangling. Joining me now to discuss the implications are Tom Vilsack, former Secretary of Agriculture and President of the U.S. Dairy Export Council, and Bruce Rastetter, Agricultural Entrepreneur and CEO of the Summit Agricultural Group. Welcome, gentlemen. It's good to be with you. Great to be here. Great to have you both. Former, Vil former Secretary Vilsack, I want to start by asking you a question, because as we had the announcement a couple weeks ago with the tariffs, uh, that China could potentially face on the U.S. Can you explain to us just briefly what do those 25% tariffs mean for farmers? What will happen? <laughs> well, it's anybody's guess, first and foremost, whether or not we will actually see th those tariffs. But uh, what it will do, uh, obviously, for farmers, it makes it very difficult for them at this point in time to know precisely what to do. I think there's concern, obviously, that it may impact the market, both short-term and long-term. You know, when you basically lose market share, uh, the potential for market share, you have to make decisions about what to plant. Uh, and it's possible that once you lose that market share, it's very difficult to get it back, or your competitors down in South America make adjustments to improve the quality of their seed, uh, to improve their transportation systems, and they become much more, of a force, much more of a force in terms of competition. So uh, I think first and foremost, uh, what we ought to be doing, and I think we are doing, uh, as an agricultural industry is to suggest to the administration to continue to dialogue, continue to talk to the Chinese, continue to look for ways to avoid uh, assessing those tariffs. There's no question that China has uh, basically gained the system, certainly as it relates to intellectual property, but there are ways in which we could solicit the help of the EU and Japan and others to put pressure on China uh, to basically change their ways without damaging agriculture. And Mr. Esther, I'm going to open it up to you because you do work pretty directly with, with farmers with your group there at Summit Agricultural Group. What have you been hearing from farmers? Are they concerned or what do they think when they hear the mention of tariffs? You know, one, one of the things is, uh, as the Secretary mentioned, uh, in terms of Brazil and other markets, as you know, I've been spending a significant amount of time in Brazil on the projects we have there as well as here. And I think the consistency of farmers here in particular uh, talk about, you know, the issues around China. It's been no secret that the challenge is around fair trade, uh, not just trade, whether it's in the challenge with the intellectual property and the theft that's gone on for decades with that, uh, with the, the tariffs, either direct or indirect, and then also with regulation. In, in January, China uh, changed uh, the, the spec on soybeans. So instead of 2% mm -hmm. foreign material, it's 1% for Iowa soybeans and it's 2% for Brazil and Argentina. So I think they understand that there's a process to go through. We hope it's, you know, a little bit of constructive tension and it needs to be to, to make it fair long term. And uh, hopefully we get through this and agriculture is just not the one in the crosshairs. And I think that's really important and I think the, the president's hearing that and getting that. 
You know, one of the challenges here uh, is that we have a tendency uh, in agriculture to speak only about agriculture, but this is really food and agriculture. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the food and agriculture industry, you're talking about a very large employer. 43 million people directly or indirectly employed by that industry. That's 28% of the workforce in the United States. The reason I stress this is because by talking about agriculture, we have a tendency in some quarters to marginalize the impact of agriculture on our economy. Uh, I think uh, Ambassador Lighthizer has suggested uh, and, and uh, Secretary Ross have suggested, well, these tariffs aren't really going to be hard. Yes, they are. If they're assessed, they're, they're going to have an impact. No question China has not pay, played by the rules. The question is how we go about making sure that they change. And I think one of the things the administration is now trying to do uh, that I think is a good thing is that they're trying to get allies in this effort. They're trying to get the EU, Japan, and others to engage in this conversation because we're not the only ones that have been impacted mm -hmm. by this uh, by this treatment from China. Absolutely, and in both of you, when you look at leverage that we do have against China, Bruce, I'll open it up to you first. Do we have any leverage to use against China to bring them to the nego well, negotiating I think, table? I think the reality today is they need the soybeans. Uh, they they uh, import 37% of their soybeans from the U.S., about 64, 65% from Brazil. The logistics capability in Brazil is not there to substitute for U.S. soybeans, so they need that. They know that they want multiple suppliers. And I think that level playing field, the ability to have ships going there, and it isn't just soybeans. It's a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, we had distiller's grain on the way to China, had a 35% tariff added to it. It's pork, uh, but it's also for the processing, and then it's U.S. products back and forth. And I know when we look at rural communities and that intellectual property theft, one of the things that whether it's in Iowa or New York boardrooms, everyone talks about that, and it needs to be dealt with so we can have vibrant manufacturing processes, technology that comes about uh, that's dealt with in a fair way that normally mm -hmm. is around the world. I want to interject here and, and direct a question back to you, former Secretary Vilsack. We've also heard this mention or rumor of a compensation plan that Secretary Perdue is working on with President Trump and other members of the administration. What would you do if you were secretary now to enact a compensation plan? Well, Secretary Purdue has a tool that I did not have, uh, which is an unfettered access to the Commodity Credit Corporation's resources, which can be used in a very thoughtful and strategic way to provide some direct assistance for a period of time. Uh, the reality is it's a stopgap measure. It's not something that you can necessarily do that, that is permanent. And frankly, I, the most of the farmers I talk to would prefer not to have a, a, a support structure and system. They would prefer to have a free and open market opportunity. Uh, and so that needs to be where the focus is. But if it works out that we are engaged in some kind of escalated trade situation where we are at some disadvantage as it relates to China because we have a fairly significant surplus when it comes to mm -hmm. agricultural trade, um, that not to lose that surplus, not to lose that market share, not to lose that opportunity. Um, Secretary Purdue could use CCC. Uh, I think it's unlikely that he's going to get any significant change within the farm bill. Uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to have a farm bill this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the way things uh, work in Washington, it usually takes a while for Absolutely. folks to reach consensus. So uh, I think the CCC is probably the, the vehicle that they're currently looking at. Okay. And I know both of you have recently been on international trips. When you are out and about talking to those members, I know Bruce, uh, Bruce you were just in, in Brazil recently. What are their thoughts about the U.S. creating a compensation plan or just the tariffs in general? Yeah, I think, I think it, it really becomes a complex situation to deal with. And back to the opportunity that, that I think Secretary Purdue is also working on that can help solve this issue is more domestic use. You know, we can clearly do that with E15 year-round. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have E15 and E10 pumps, which solves the infrastructure issue. And, and I think that's the best message for China, that we can consume more <clears throat> internally and we can have that demand here. And I think in Brazil, it becomes complicated. Uh, as you know, Brazil has a 35% tax on every U.S. good that goes mm -hmm. there if it's not manufactured down there. And at the same time, they had a 20% tariff they put on ethanol a year and a half ago. And shortly after that, we let Brazilian beef into the U.S. tariff free. So I think there needs, and there's talks on that issue going on, uh, but they're eyeing the world market, wondering if that's not an opportunity for them on soybeans. Absolutely. China's got quite a surplus of grain on they hand, do. and that's, that's an issue. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I recently have been uh, to China twice this year, uh, and I recently had a conversation with Chinese, high-ranking Chinese officials. This is a very confident nation. 
It's a very confident nation. Uh, their, uh, their economy is expanding. Uh, they are urbanizing their population. Uh, they feel v they have developed relationships around the world. Uh, they feel very strong. Uh, and, I, and I think the message that was conveyed to me very clearly was that they are not fearful uh, of any kind of trade escalation. They would prefer to, to avoid it. They think in the long run it's not beneficial to them or to, to all of us, frankly. And that's certainly what I hear from other capitals. I've been in Brussels, I've been in London, I've been in, in Dubai, I've been in, uh, in, in uh, Dublin recently. Mm -hmm. And the consistent message from world leaders that I talk to is uh, the world doesn't need a trade war at this point in time. The global economy is perking up a little bit and this might put a damper on it. The U.S. economy is working pretty well right now. So w we need to look for ways creatively to engage in dialogue, and I think the administration's doing that. Um, and I think Secretary Perdue has done a good job. And I wish he, I wish he would talk to his friend of commerce, uh, Secretary <laughs> Ross. Doesn't seem to understand the importance of the food and agriculture industry, but you know we're working on that. What's the most important issue you see affecting farmers back home watching today? Well, I think it's access to those markets. I mean, clearly, whether in particular NAFTA and maybe it goes in priorities. 33% of the pork goes there, significant grain. Uh, then it's China. And then it's accessing uh, those other world emerging markets that we need to have access to. So it, it's a variety of things. And it's also the regulations, the specs. We can't sell a lot of product to Europe, e even though it's open to some things like soybeans, but not really soybean meal, not ethanol, and, and uh, certainly not pork, but we bring their pork here. So agriculture does have a mixed bag here, and depending on the industry you're in, the benefit or lack of it ends up being in, in your court. So mm -hmm. we need a broader look at it. It's important to get NAFTA right. We need to preserve what's working in our Mexican markets, because as Bruce said, it's an amazingly important market. But we need to fix what isn't working, which is the Canadian market, especially as it relates to dairy. We need to open that market up. We need to get rid of class sevens distorting the powder market. I think uh, Bruce is also right. Uh, China is incredibly important, but so is all of Southeast Asia. Uh, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, these are incredibly important areas for us to, to engage in, in an effort. Re rejoining TPP certainly would be helpful. Uh, the work that the administration did on course, thankfully, did not negatively impact mm -hmm. uh, agriculture, and that's a good thing. As far as Europe is concerned, <laughs> you know, the reality is we're not going to get clarity there until Europe and, and, and the UK, the United Kingdom, figure out how they're going to divide and divorce themselves. Right. And I think that could have a potential impact. It could free up the United Kingdom to become a, a bilateral trading uh, partner, or it could restrict them. Uh, the restrictions that Bruce mentioned may still apply with the UK as they split away from Brexit. Uh, in my trips to Europe, what I've learned is it's incredibly complicated and no one has a clear vision about precisely how that split's going to take place. So I think we need to keep an eye on what's happening in Brexit. If you want to see all of our discussion, please go to IPTV.org slash MTOM or our YouTube channel, YouTube slash Market to Market. Tom Vilsack, Bruce Rassetter, thank you both so much for your time. Thank you. Next, the Market to Market Report. Despite last week's threat of a trade war and this week's shift in trade policy, the commodity markets continued to ask for proof of a problem. For the week, May wheat was flat. The nearby corn contract fell two cents. Even with a higher carryout and lingering tariff threats, the May soybean contract skyrocketed 21 cents. Meal, which has been leading the way, fell 350 per ton. In the softs, nearby cotton improved $1.17 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, May Class 3 milk futures were two cents higher. The livestock sector finished in positive territory as the June cattle contract moved $1.32 higher. May feeders put on $4.75 and the June lean hog contract bumped up $4.37. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index moved five ticks higher. Crude oil pumped at 5.33 per barrel, a nearly 9% increase. Comex Gold added 11.80 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index moved more than 24 points higher to finish the week at 4.67.65. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Angie Setzer. Angie, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Angie, let's get right into it here. Let's start in the wheat markets, of course. With the massive ending stocks that we, of course, saw this week with mm -hmm. WASD, how much more upside potential do you see? Let's talk Chicago wheat yeah. specifically. 
Well, I mean, the, the Chicago weed is, has always been known to be a follower, so you've got to look at what's happening elsewhere. And one of the biggest things that we're seeing right now, of course, is what's going on in the Southern Plains. Um, drought conditions there in, in a lot of areas remain entrenched. I mean, just yesterday it was 100 degrees in, in areas in the Southern Plains there with a, an exceptional wind. Mm -hmm. Wildfires, and I think. Wildfires, and our, our prayers go out definitely to the, the farmers down there that are dealing with that. So there's a lot of issues down that way, not to mention wheat also experienced a pretty Pretty substantial freeze. Now it's behind in development, but uh, it, it obviously will be impacted by temperatures in the teens. There's discussion of temperatures in the 20s uh, or or lower even this coming weekend. So mm -hmm. you know, we'd always they always say wheat has nine lives, but we're definitely working on eight or nine here with a lot of that crop. Now, of course, with the substantial amount of stocks that we have left over, the the feeling is well, we're comfortable with what we have. We can chew into those and and work on from there, which is very true. But we have to see also what's going on in the northern. Plains. So it's a, a tale of two different cities. You're you're very dry in the south, but you're too wet, too cold, all of those things in the north. And so we're we're getting to where we're feeling delayed on, on planting of spring mm -hmm. wheat, and people are going to make decisions there as well. So the overall narrative right now is we have a bunch of wheat and we're going to have a bunch more with the idea that that you know I've said it before on the show, wheat is either a record crop or it's dead. And right now we're I guess we're trading that it's a record crop in the meantime, but we'll have to see what happens. We'll be starting wheat tours here over over the next few weeks in the Southern Plains and kind of seeing how that looks now that it, it's working its way towards, um, you know, heading out and, and getting some maturity. Let's see what happens in the Northern Plains. But for now, wheat is is not the, the golden child of the market, at least. Absolutely. And when we look at weather impacting markets, the weather is also impacting the corn and soybean mm -hmm. markets as we look at planting. We've had crop insurance states for a couple different states now. When you look at corn specifically with delayed plantings, what's that going to do for our markets and our prices? Well, it's definitely something we're going to want to watch. I mean, the market itself is not going to get too worked up about okay. delayed plantings until around Mother's Day. That's what everyone says. When does the market pay attention? I say Mother's Day. There's some folks that, of course, will tell you that they're already behind, and they are. Um, that It is an issue specifically with reaching maximum yield potential. I mean, you can plant well into May in, in a lot of areas, but you're going to be pollinating during the, the heat of the summer. And so that's something that we'll want to be concerned about. The idea for me, or, or what I look at right now really is it's more of a bearish factor for soybeans and the idea that we can't get spring wheat planted. We may be delayed a little bit on some corn plantings, but the reality is if we were planting actively right now in corn, it would be a, a pretty bearish situation because then we'd be looking at picking up more acres, mm -hmm. looking at the potential for 90, 91 million. That's not happening. Um, so we can almost get to where we're, we're married to that 88 number. You know, of course, things can change very quickly, um, especially when it comes to weather. Absolutely. But at, at this point in time, it is something we'll want to watch. And it is something that could end up being more of a bearish factor in soybeans here in the next three, four weeks. Okay. The other thing I wanted to make sure that we got to touch on today mm -hmm. in the corn markets is our corn export mm -hmm. numbers um, for Brazil and Argentina with reduced export competition for these countries. What do you expect that do, to do to the 2018-19 marketing year for the U.S.? I think it could be huge. It's been something that I've been paying attention to. You know, I've, I've argued for a while that the soybean production number in Argentina is big, but the corn production number is, is potentially bigger. Mm -hmm. We'll want to be watching what's going on in Brazil. They're, they've started their second crop corn off. Right. Um, they're looking at much drier than normal conditions for the next couple, three weeks. Of course, it's early yet, but we'll want to see if that's a, an indicator of a pattern. Um, with the soybean market taking the attention like it is in Brazil and, and in, um, from a global standpoint, too, you're not going to see Brazil actively working to export corn. They're coming into their soybean export period. So I think we'll continue to see good shipment pace. This past week, we saw extraordinary um, corn shipment pace. I think we'll continue to see that. And I think we'll continue to see interest in U.S. corn. As long as we stay competitive from a global standpoint, I'm excited to see what happens during the last half of the marketing year into the first half of next year. I think maybe even the bigger story this week was soybeans mm -hmm. export Huge. sales numbers. Yeah. Where did that come from? Well, the one thing that we saw as soon as the tariffs were announced, it was a conversation that we had quickly, is that the Brazilian farmer in, in Brazilian agribusinesses down that way basically pulled their offer of soybeans for May. It became one of those things where if we're going to be the only provider of soybeans in the global market structure, we want to be paid more for them. Um, and so it was really interesting to see how the cash market trades, and it actually... In, 
ended up leading futures, you could say, mm -hmm. because we did see soybeans rally pretty substantially this week. And that was because of the fact that, you know, your, our, our foreign buyers realized, okay, U.S. is competitive. The tariffs are not in place yet. We saw an unknown, who typically is our friend <laughs> right. China, yes. come in and buy big chunks of beans. We heard the Argentina story. Um, and, we, you know, we, the one thing to be aware of in the cash market when it comes to exporting and things like that is arbitrage. So it's very, very possible that those Argentina sales could be sold to Argentina, but never ever even mm -hmm. reach their their Absolutely. borders. Um, and so that'll be interesting to see. Do we end up uh, crushing and shipping? Do we ship whole beans in the name of Argentina to China or something like that? So there's a lot of developments that have taken place. The, the global demand for soybeans remains insatiable, and that's something to remember, um, and definitely something to watch as we move ahead. So it is surprising in the sense that everyone's telling you that we should be sad about uh, the export potential, but it's not necessarily surprising if you were paying attention to what was taking place in the basis in the, the global export market itself. Right, and when we look at where prices have sat after the announcement of mm -hmm. potential threats, we're almost back or maybe maybe back a contract month mm -hmm. to where we were before this announcement. Yes, yeah, we're above actually within yeah, okay. about a nickel of contract highs on soybeans before today, yeah. With that being said, where do you expect soybeans to go? Do you expect us to see some further upside potential? There's soybeans are, are magic. You know what I mean. At, at this point in time, they they really. I said it the last time I was on the show. It's like pushing a beach ball underwater. They remain that way. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some inflationary uh, feel developing in the market. It, it, if if we were a year ago with the bearish sentiment that we had towards commodities a year ago, we'd have probably been down limit multiple days based on the tariff announcement itself. Obviously, at this point in time, buyers are looking to protect their position. The funds have come in and been aggressive uh, supporters of the market structure. Uh, we have had aggressive farmer selling. So at this point in time, you don't have typically, like in corn, if you get a big rally, you're going to see farmer selling come in and kind of cut cut some mm -hmm. top top end off of, of rally potential. Soybeans, that's basically gone. There's not a lot of farmers with old crop beans left, and there's not a lot of farmers with excessive new crop sales open. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. The funds will be able to protect their investment until they decide not to. And so I'm, I'm waiting for the day that we get a, a bullish announcement in the market and end up with a bearish close, and, and maybe that'll be an indicator of things to come. But at this point, even seeing that on Tuesday and Wednesday, mm -hmm. uh, the market has not been uh, overly excited to, to move much lower. Absolutely. We're going to save the social media questions for Market Plus, which you can find online at iptv.org slash mtom. Angie, I want to make sure we hit the meets this week because yes. we had a lot of news. When we look at the April contract, April live cattle contract, mm -hmm. the cash price has been a lot stronger than the yeah. futures price. What is that indicating to you? It's telling me that the cash market strength is there. I mean, that's I tend to, to say in cattle, and, and uh, you know, I'm no expert by any means, uh, but I, I tend to say that cash can lead futures, and that's what we've seen. We, we started to see the cash price really kind of recover, firm up a bit. We've continued to see that here, and, and we've seen uh, the futures side of things start to recover and firm up mm -hmm. a bit. You know, the months that you're seeing the best open interest in have been much stronger here and have actually been uh, trading at a little bit higher level, and, and we're seeing cash announcements today back up to decent levels. It'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I, I think the overwhelming expectation of bearish fundamentals, you know, kind of impacted the futures market more than anything. You couldn't, you know, hit a, throw a rock without hitting someone telling you about the the lack of hook capacity come this summer. Right. You know, wall of cattle has been exactly. the joke. Exactly. Uh, the 500, know, for, I think it's 580 million pounds that we're going to be going into. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and so that's been the constant conversation is there's a wall of cattle coming. We've heard it for two years now. I guess we'll continue to see if it's it's working its way this way. You know, I think what we're, we're seeing really is, is the unfortunate um, concern over what's going to happen with this year's calf crop. I mean, that is a, a big issue um, with the weather conditions mm -hmm. that we're in. Unfortunately, you know, my prayers go out also to the folks dealing with the blizzard because that's the last thing you want to see when you have young calves. You know, I, a friend of mine posted, my calves have seen the sun three times this month yeah. and, and they're a month old, you know. So it's definitely something we want to watch, something that'll have a big uh, impact on the, the cash market going forward as well because no one's in a big hurry to load out cattle. Mm -hmm. We did see weights drop off a bit this week versus a week ago. They are still a bit heavier than a year ago, but we did see weights back off. And that's not necessarily a, a bearish, overwhelming factor in, in the market structure. So we'll want to watch and see what happens. But I think we've 
uh, potentially put in a short-term low there. Really quick here before mm -hmm. we transition into hogs, with weather affecting potential cow-calf herds, mm -hmm. what's that going to do for the feeders and placements? Is that going to impact our herd that we get? Well, I think you could see with the drought in the south, you could see an increase in placements, of course, because you're going to be moving them off pasture okay. into feedlots. Mm -hmm. And so that'll be something that we'll definitely have to keep in mind. A lot of folks will look at higher placement numbers and think that's a bearish indicator. Reality is you, you may have higher placements, but your, your cattle in pasture or on pasture, you know, are much lower than what they were even a year ago. Okay. Really quick here, we yeah. want to, of course, tackle hogs because they also had a big week this mm -hmm. week. The April contract is going off the board soon, and there's been pretty, a pretty good spread between the June and mm -hmm. April contracts. Well, it might look like we have a bottom on the chart. Do you think so? And, and if so, how much can, more can we get June to rally off of that? It, the hard part right now is that we have seen the June stay at such a high level and it's seen some support. I think we got some really positive news with the Argentina announcement. That's a pretty big market. Their their expansion and, and domestic demand down there is, okay. is huge. So I think that should help support the market. But I always have a worry, you know, the, the old right, adage. Angie. Well, I'm going to have to stop you there. We'll get you uh, get back to that in Market Plus. All right. Angie, thank you so much. That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will, of course, keep the conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at iptv.org slash mtom. Looking to avoid our social media channels, but still want to let us know how you feel, send an old-fashioned email to Market to Market at iptv.org. Join us again next week when we examine how the dairy industry is weathering another year of low prices. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.